We look down on Earth not as citizens of any one country, but citizens of planet Earth. EGS Program Chief Engineer, verify no constraints to launch. EGS Chief Engineer team has no constraints. I copy that. You are clear to launch. Five, four, three, two, one, and liftoff. Power clear. Now passing through max Q, maximum dynamic pressure. Welcome to space. Since the year 2000, there have been humans in space, nonstop, every day. The International Space Station has been an engineering marvel, research laboratory, and platform for unparalleled exploration. This month, we celebrate the 20th anniversary of the launch of the first element of the International Space Station to low Earth orbit. In this episode, we sit down with the space shuttle commander who officially began construction of the ISS in space. Former astronaut Bob Cabana recounts his experiences in being the first American on station and turning on the lights. All right, so I am in the booth this morning uh, with Bob Cabana. Bob, thanks for being here this morning. Absolutely, Josh. My pleasure. So that's the most simple introduction possible for you, but the, <laughs> the longer introduction is, Len, let me see if I can get this right, uh, Naval Academy graduate, colonel in the Marine Corps, yep. astronaut, test pilot, Kennedy Space Center Center Director, and four-time space shuttle astronaut. Yeah, that sums it up. We also have uh, a biking enthusiast, as well as a recreational pilot, a mud runner, and I think the only thing we're, things we're missing are, are juggler and ballet in there. <laughs> I'm so. a lousy juggler. <laughs> 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 but I'm doing a 100-mile bike ride on uh, Sunday. I'm going to do the Space Coast Century. Oh, very good. Very good. That's awesome. Um, but we have you here today to talk about the International Space Station. It is very arguably the greatest engineering accomplishment of humanity's history. Um, and you had the privilege of being there when we started the space station. Yeah, it, what a phenomenal uh, accomplishment the space station is. A superb engineering testbed to prove the systems that we need for long-duration spaceflight and establishing a presence beyond our home planet and our solar system. Uh, just uh, a model of international and uh, commercial partnership, you know, as we move forward. But, I mean, when you consider that we've got the United States, Russia, Canada, Japan, the European Space Agency, and all its partners, and we have been working together as one up there for now 20 years. I mean, that is amazing. In spite of all our political differences, um, the crews on the space station and the crews on the ground in mission control, we work together as one. And I think it's a model for how we move forward as we uh, return to the moon and we go on to Mars. I want to kind of take people back to, like you mentioned, 20 years ago. Can you give us a picture of what's happening in the in the world and in the NASA world? <laughs> um, because obviously, like this is a huge moment. It's a it's a pivotal moment in our history. So set set a scene for me here. I'll go back a little bit further. Um, as we were uh, doing the International Space Station, at the time uh, I'd gotten back off my uh, my third flight, my first command, and um, I was asked to be the chief of the NASA's astronaut office, and that was August 1994. And this is the time that we had uh, just agreed to do the shuttle Mir program with our Russian partners. And it, we would not have been successful on the International Space Station had we not first done shuttle Mir with the Russians. So my first trip to uh, Russia was in January of 1995 not long after the wall had come down, and I went over to see how uh, Norm Thagard and Bonnie Dunbar were doing. They were in the two astronauts, prime and backup, training to fly that first shuttle Mir mission, and also to see uh, what kind of accommodations were in Star City for uh, <laughs> Shannon Lucid, who was uh, also going up uh, on Mir. And uh, to me, it, it was really kind of surreal. I, I'm, I remember it was... Uh, 11, 12 o'clock at night, and I went cross-country skiing with a Swedish astronaut, Krister Fugelsang, who was over there training. And here I am, an active duty colonel in the United States Marine Corps, cross-country skiing with this Swede in the middle of the night on what was a secret base going through holes and fences, <laughs> and, and it was just hmm. uh, wow. really unique. But anyway, the, so the Shuttle Mir program allowed us 
to work with the Russians to do the uh, International Space Station, um, the docking adapter that we put, uh, STS-71 Atlantis, uh, was the first mission to dock with the Mir space station. After 20 years, our spacecraft are docked in orbit again. Our new era of space exploration has begun. And we had moved the airlock out of the mid-deck into the payload bay, and then we put the Russian docking uh, adapter on it. The systems that we actually dock with Mir, and it's the same system that we docked with the International Space Station, was a uh, Russian design, and it was based on uh, essentially the same uh, docking mechanism that was on the Apollo Soyuz uh, spacecraft. So, you know, it was really uh, interesting building that relationship, working with the Russians, uh, and setting the stage for that first space station assembly mission. So, I had been chief of the astronaut office for uh, three years, and I really wanted to go fly in space again. And um, I, I got assigned to fly that first space station assembly mission. From the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, this is Space Shuttle Endeavour Launch Control. Now, this mission will mark the beginning of a five-year orbital assembly of the space station and kick off a new era of international space exploration using the resources and expertise of 16 nations. What's that moment like? I mean, that's got to that's got to feel like really special. Well, it was, it was just cool. I mean, it's always cool to fly a first, but it, it was it was great to be back in uh, in the training flow for another mission. So, if I look back on you know that time while I was chief of the astronaut office, um, we established our relationship with the Russians. I developed a relationship with the Russians that I worked with in uh, Star City. Uh, we had crews flying on the Mir space station, and I, I started assigning the crews for uh, the future uh, International Space Station missions, and had assigned crews to the to the first three missions essentially, and folks didn't necessarily want to be assigned to space station missions at that time because the program had been delayed. Mm. Uh, we were flying eight to nine shuttle missions a year, and you could wow. fly a lot more frequently or fly a shuttle mission. You know, committing to fly on a space station mission meant uh, training in Russia. It meant learning Russian. It meant being uh, assigned at least two years ahead of time to train to go fly on a space station, wow. it, it was very challenging. It was not something that was easy. And uh, our method of training astronauts to fly on space station and working with our international partners has changed over time. It's still a, a two-year training flow for a specific flight. But I think we have a better understanding of what's required, and we have a better understanding how to work with our Russian partners in, in learning the Soyuz systems and the Russian systems on the space station and so on. So. Bottom line, it was a challenge uh, for those folks on those first missions. Now, the assembly mission, that that was run just like an, a standard NASA space shuttle mission. And uh, we were assigned uh, uh, as a crew a year ahead of time. We ended up flying uh, about a year late okay. than, from when we were supposed to because of delays that were encountered. But it, I remember it was, um, it was November of uh, 1998. Uh, I had the entire crew over to my house, and we watched the FGB launch on a uh, proton rocket from the uh, Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan, and that was a successful launch, and we knew we had a mission. So, it, And the FGB was the Russian portion, the, the first piece the of The first that. segment. And that, yeah. that was actually, uh, it was, uh, if you look at the designation of that, that was... Um, uh, Assembly Mission 1AR, American-Russian, and that's because uh, it, the FGV was built in Russia, but uh, we paid for it uh, through Boeing on a, a contract with Boeing, and it was a, a U.S. paid-for module built by the Russians. Hmm. Wow. So, and uh, the FGV, functional cargo block, was named Zarya, which means sunrise in Russian. And uh, that... Once that launched, we knew we had a mission. And yeah. it, two weeks later, we were definitely going to space with the <laughs> uh, with Node One, the the Unity node. So we were STS eighty eight. That was the space shuttle designation. But from an ISS point of view, we were flight two uh, A, the second American assembly uh, awesome. flight to ISS. But it was the first assembly mission. So uh, I had an awesome crew. Um, you know, uh, my pilot Rick Sturko. Uh, he, uh, a Marine, that was his first flight. 
Uh, Rick is now one of the test pilots for uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, flying uh, oh, very his, cool. his rocket plane. Uh, <laughs> oh man! You know, and uh, he he went on to fly uh, four space shuttle missions, commanding two of them. Uh, Jerry Ross uh, was uh, doing, he was lead for the EVAs, uh, an, an EVA expert. Nancy Curry was my flight engineer and prime arm, arm operator. Um, Nancy uh, has a PhD in industrial engineering and had been a helicopter pilot before uh, coming to NASA. Uh, Jim Newman. Um, Jim is an expert in uh, rendezvous and proximity operations. Uh, he was on the crew and also one of my EVA uh, members. And and then uh, we had Sergey Kriklov added to our crew. Sergey had flown on uh, on the space shuttle um, back when uh, Vladimir Titov also flew on a on a space shuttle mission and had trained in the United States as part of our exchanges. And he got added on to have uh, Russian experience as, uh, as we went up. Sergey has just been a real asset on this flight. Uh, I don't think we'd have uh, hardly any pictures or uh, any time to do anything if we didn't have him helping out. He's uh, super at uh, helping us with EVA, and he's super with just about everything. And so that was the crew. And uh, on December 4th, we launched on the space shuttle Endeavor. Uh, off with the Node 1 tucked away in the payload bay to begin the assembly of the International Space Station. Now, we tried to launch on December 3rd, but uh, we were unable to. And uh, it, it was just things didn't go right in the launch count. It just wasn't real smooth. Sure. <clears throat> and the weather wasn't all that great. But we had an issue starting one of the uh, auxiliary power units. And um, by the time the ground figured out that everything was okay, and uh, we counted down to 18 seconds and, and oh, didn't man. go. This is SD. I copy. Sensing what may have caused our master alarm. Is that an LCC uh, hold for you, Ray? Right now, and uh, yeah, hold on. we can explain it, we have an LCC violation. Flight last time to pick up is 858 colon 01. And flight, I copy. And we concur. Yellow copies. Ecom, everything looking okay on your side? They were sitting around at 147. That's correct, flight. Everything looks great. Anybody else? Look closer, folks. Go fly. You still go? No, sir. GLS pick up a count on your mark. NTD flight. We are no go for launch. Copy that. And GLS NTD. Yes, sir. We would pick up the count. We're at 24 seconds. Request cut off. Please cut off. Yes, sir. And and it was because of the time that it took to determine whether or not um, you know everything was okay to launch, and then they realized we didn't have. We delayed enough that we didn't have enough propellant mm. in order to do the rendezvous. So we scrubbed 18 seconds from launch. Oh. Close call there, Ed. Good job. Yeah, it was a close call. Fine. And it was okay. You know, we went back. Sure. And then the sure. next night we went out, and, and it was absolutely perfect. It was one of the smoothest launch, launch counts I've seen. Everything continues to look good, and we are cleared for launch today. No problems are being reported from the vehicle or the crew. Hello, Bruce. Let's go do this tonight. Amen. Uh, we're going to do it tonight. You have a very exciting mission ahead of you. We wish you maximum success. Success. Endeavor Roger. Thanks a lot. Ten, nine, eight. We have a go for main engine start. We have main engine start. Four, three, two, one. We have booster ignition and liftoff of the Space Shuttle Endeavor with the first American element of the International Space Station uniting our efforts in space to achieve our common goals. My daughter and I are real Wizard of Oz aficionados. Okay. And uh, uh, they had re-released the Wizard of Oz all color corrected and up to date and everything right before my launch. Right. And so my daughter and I went to see it. And uh, it, it was awesome. So... Uh, the night we didn't launch, the next day, there was a picture on the front page of the Orlando Sentinel. And it had Endeavor on the launch pad with this huge rainbow. And uh, Red Huber took the picture. I have it framed in my office, and Red signed it for me. And uh, like I said, everything went perfect. And the first wake-up music that we had on orbit uh, the day after launch was Judy Garland singing Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Awesome.
And man, I had I had tears coming down. It was emotional. Yeah. And uh, it, you know, it, it just it, it all came together. And so what I tell folks is that uh, somewhere over the rainbow, dreams really do come true because <laughs> we launched over that rainbow and we had an absolutely dream flight from start right. to finish, Josh. Endeavor Houston, good morning, and that long distance dedication was to Bob from Sarah. So getting into kind of this mission, obviously like there was a design for the space station, there was a plan for the space station, but do you really did you really kind of grasp the magnitude of what you all were beginning? Oh, because the implications I, have been tremendous. I, I I think so, and and we knew the criticality of being successful on that very first flight. I mean, we trained really hard. Uh, it was, you know, one of the things that we talked about in building the International Space Station. It was called the Wall of EVA. All the the spacewalks that we had to do in order to be successful uh, building the space station. We had three of them on on my flight. And, you know, it, it, what we showed was, we know how to do this. And uh, we were extremely successful. Um, it, it just, uh, I can't think of how it could have gone better from, uh, from start to finish. Um, when I talk about, you talk about the impact, did we know what we were saying? And I wish I'd have brought it with me. I, I can't remember it verbatim. But um, when we were inside the space station for the first time, and I'll come back to more of that, but we made the first log entry in the logbook of the International Space Station. And I wrote, I was sitting there thinking about what I wanted to say, and I wrote it all down, and then the entire crew signed it. But cool. the bottom line was that we recognized the importance of what we were doing. And the one line that I, I remember distinctly was, um, from small beginnings, great things come. And awesome. when I look back on that, that small beginning of the International Space Station, just those two modules, the Unity node and what an appropriate name, Unity, binding us all together as one, and Zarya, Sunrise, a new beginning. Um, the size of the International Space Station then and what it is today and, yeah. and all that we have accomplished and learned on it and have yet to learn on it and what it is still capable of doing, you know, it truly is just a phenomenal facility. So you mentioned this logbook. So is this something that is this a document that every commander that goes up? Yeah, and the writes crew in? on. Yeah, absolutely. It's up on orbit right now. It's the International Space Station logbook. And are they? And I, hopefully, on the last flight of the space station, somebody's going to bring it home. But yeah. You know. So is is it just like? Um, it's like the I've, ship's log. I've, you know, Captain Kirk, star date. <laughs> So is it is it lighthearted? Is it very professional? Obviously, yours was a very like important milestone of like we're doing this for the it, future. It, it's a it's a takeoff on ship's logs, it, okay. and and there are special entries that gets get made. I mean, on, on New Year's Eve, there's always a special entry that uh, the officer of the deck has to put into the ship's log on special occasions and stuff like that. So it it's a document that the crews have signed, the crews have made special entries, and it's not so much a, an exact, this is everything that's gone on on the space station, but it's uh, it kind of takes after, you know, the history of logbooks on ships. So kind of take us through this this moment. Obviously, like, you have a mission on orbit, you're preparing, you're, you've captured um, the Russian portion, you're, you're getting ready... Uh, Kind of talk us through, like, what's this like to finally, like, join these two and then allow it to become one, essentially? Well, you know, first off, <clears throat> watching Nancy lift the node out of the payload bay, she had an inch or less of clearance on each side. And, and she just, I didn't know you could move the arm that slow. <laughs> but, but, I mean, she did it so precisely. I had shot where the camera was moving because Nancy was moving it so slow that it looked like a still photo every time I tried to tape something. And then we lifted it up, <clears throat> she lifted it up and positioned it over the uh, over the docking station and I fired the thrusters to bring the two pieces together and and then we uh, used the docking system to drive uh, drive them closed and close the latches and that, that mated unity to the orbiter. Then we did the rendezvous with the, uh, the FGB. It was a flawless rendezvous. And we have we have all kinds of tools during the rendezvous. The KU band antenna on the orbiter provides range and range rate. Uh, we had handheld lasers when we got in closer, shooting it to get range and range rate. Um, the, the orbiter, the computers on it, 
um, even after we upgraded, only had 256k of memory in each one. So <laughs> you, you're, you're you're limited as to the. Uh, they're very uh, radiation hardened computers, very sure. reliable and, and run extremely well. But we had to load software depending on which phase of the mission we were in because it wasn't all within the computer's capability. So what we used to do to get more information available to us is <clears throat> we'd bring um, an IBM 760 laptop. 760 XD computers on board, and we set up our own local area network, uh, pulling data uh, off the PCMMU from the orbiter. And one of the programs that we ran was called uh, RPOP, Rendezvous Proximity Operations Program. And uh, Jim Newman, prior to being selected as an astronaut, used to train Rendezvous uh, Proximity Operations. Uh, he was one of our trainers, and he actually wrote the programs for RPOP. Cool. So I had that running, and that it shows your rendezvous profile. It predicts where you're going to go, and so you kind of know based on the jet firings, you know how you're following it, right? And of course, you got guidance from the orbiter itself. And and then I got uh, Jim Newman, who has trained people on all of this, you know, in my ear. Well, what do you think about a couple of ups? How about an in? You know, so <laughs> I'm using just, my, just suggestions because because obviously you're, right. you're in charge. I'm of this in charge. Point. So I'm using my uh, inboard uh, onboard. Uh, internal Coleman filter to filter all this data that I have to do what I think is right for the rendezvous, and it went perfect. So I flew the FGB right down into the payload bay, and um, yeah, I couldn't see it out the windows because the node was in the way. After a certain point, I'm bringing it into the payload bay, just relying on cameras. I had a centerline camera looking up at it, and one on the end of the arm looking across at it, <clears throat> and, had to, and, and flew it down so it was stopped, perfectly stable. The grapple fixture was three feet from the end of the arm. All Nancy Curry had to do is move that arm three feet and grab it, right? But awesome. we had to we had to wait till we were over a Russian ground site to confirm that the FGB was in free drift before we grabbed it, because you wouldn't want to grab a hold of it and have its uh, flight control system still on, sure. fighting the arm, right, sure. and breaking the arm. Yeah, Chris, uh, we were wondering uh, if we seem to be moving pretty good here. Uh, what the first ground site. Uh, was over Russia where we could uh, verify Raku 5 and 6 power off and make sure everything's good. Bob, good question. Sally says we're verifying it as we speak. So <clears throat> it's, it's all stable. It's right there, and, and we're waiting to grab it. The orbiter, um, it, it's hard to fly six degrees of freedom at, run, at once. It, pitch, roll, and yaw, as well as the translations, you know, X, Y, and Z. So yeah. we program the autopilot to maintain the attitude, pitch, roll, and yaw, and then all you have to worry about are, are the translations. Sure. So it drifts slightly, and, and there's a dead band that it operates within, and when it reaches the edge of that dead band, the jets fire to center it back up again. When the jets fire, um, you don't always get a pure... Uh, pitch roll and yaw. You get uh, roll yaw coupling, sure. uh, inertial coupling. Yeah, in what in space, that float obviously like it's it's not like you're flying through the air. It's well, a very different game. Yeah, but but similar but different. So <laughs> so what happens when you get this inertial coupling is instead of getting a pure pitch roll or yaw, you get a translation also. And we hit a dead band and this happened. <clears throat> all right. Well, everything was stable and we were just waiting to grab it. And so all of a sudden, this 45,000-pound uh, mass FGB is moving into the payload bay and toward the arm. It's going to hit us. And, and so I fired the jets to back away from it and nothing happened. It's still coming to hit us. And uh, it's, you program the digital autopilot depending on the phase of the mission. And we were uh, in a very fine control. There's an A digital autopilot and a B that you've programmed. And I was in the B DAP for very fine control. Fortunately, I had enough sense to select the A DAP, get <laughs> some more control power, and we were able to back away from it. And, uh, you know, then that was saved us there and then moved back in, got all stable again, and, and we're ready to grab it once it was in free drift. So while all this was happening, you know, uh, Jim, who had been very vocal throughout the entire rendezvous, offering advice, it was just dead silence in the <laughs> cockpit, right? Nobody said anything. So I'm assuming everybody's seeing this happen in real time. Oh, yeah. So yeah. everyone knows what's going on. And uh, when, when it was all over, I said, Jim, I said, how come you didn't offer me any advice when that happened? He says, well, I know when to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> but but that, uh, you know, that, that was probably the, for me, that was the most challenging part of the whole mission, you know, being able to uh, react to that and do the right thing. 
But uh, once it was all stable again, we got over a Russian ground site. Uh, they said, you're clear to grapple. Nancy grabbed it. We lifted it up, uh, positioned it over the top of the uh, uh, node on uh, the other pressurized mating adapter, PMA2. And this was a blind, uh, we didn't have anything where we could see precisely how we were aligned. We had a visual system that had dots that was supposed to help us, and we had camera views and stuff that we'd practiced a lot in the simulator, and uh, which is not always as, as exact as actually being in real life. But sure. we were able to uh, position it, make sure it was in the right spot, fired the thrusters again, brought those two pieces together, and uh, drove it tight. And at that point, uh, we had the beginnings of the International Space Station. Jim and Jerry went out subsequently on a couple of spacewalks, connecting power and data connectors on the ISS. And then uh, it came time for uh, ingress. Prior to ingressing, uh, Sergey and I activated the space station. We had another uh, set of computer, 760XD computers uh, back on the uh, aft flight deck <clears throat> where we sent the commands to power up and activate uh, the International Space Station and get its uh, systems working. And we'd spent hours in the uh, in the uh, software development facility in Houston, uh, Boeing, uh, out at Sunny Carter, testing the software. Um, we found errors that were corrected. Uh, we did uh, mission essential integration tests at KSC. We spent hours down here at the Cape uh, testing the node software uh, hooked up to an emulator of the FGB where we found more problems and uh, corrected them. And uh, when we got on orbit and sent those commands, I, I'm telling you, nobody was more surprised than me that everything worked perfect. <laughs> I mean, there was not, not one anomaly. I mean, it, it just, every procedure that we went through, we, we powered it up and everything worked uh, perfectly. But this is our goal. It's uh, building a space station and uh, setting the pace for the future. Uh, we're sure enjoying it up here. It's extremely challenging, but it's uh, also extremely rewarding. And when you get to look out the window and see uh, Zarya and Unity join together and knowing that you get to go inside tomorrow, uh, it's pretty awesome. And that set the stage for uh, uh, ingress into the uh, FGB, which was on uh, December 10th, uh, 1998. And uh, when it came time to uh, enter the, the space station for the first time, I'd gotten a lot of questions from the media, who's going to be the first one inside? Yeah. And I didn't tell anybody. I didn't even tell the crew. And when it came time to open the hatch, I said, Sergey, get up here. Cabana and uh, Sergey Krikalev enter the module. Yeah, and, and there's video of this out there. So you can, <laughs> I mean, you can see literally like you're there at, at the passageway between these two modules. Commander Bob Cabana and uh, Sergey Krikalev entering uh, the module together. The first astronauts uh, aboard uh, the International Space Station in orbit. And you, you grab Sergey and walk us through what happens. So uh, I, I believe that this is an International Space Station. We need to enter as an international crew. So every hatch that we opened as we went from the airlock uh, through the docking station into the pressurized mating adapter, into the node, into PMA2, into the FGB, Sergey and I enter each one side by side. So there was no first person in the International Space Station. I got to be the first American and Sergey was the first Russian. But I, I felt it really important that we make that statement that we enter as, a, as an international crew. And then when we'd finally ingressed through all the modules and we were into the FGB, uh, we set up and we did a, uh, a press conference from inside uh, the FGB, the first press con conference from the International Space Station with the entire crew. And, uh, unbelievable. Uh, if you got live coverage, look at the volume Sergey is floating around in. Uh, we are so pleased and excited and proud to be uh, a part of the team that made this happen. And our special thanks to all the ISS folks, all their hard work. Uh, we remember when Unity was just an aluminum shell, and it is a truly fine piece of hardware. And uh, just thanks to everybody in the space station program for all their hard work. And man, we had a lot of work to do. We we uh, to get it ready. And and Sergey, in addition to being on that flight, was also on the first crew to actually uh, live on the International Space Station. 
the first crew that launched to the space station, that was in October of 2000. And the commander of the Soyuz was um, Yuri Gedzinko, and the commander of the space station was Bill Shepard, and uh, uh, Sergei was the uh, engineer on that flight. And we wanted to make sure that we got as much done to have it ready for when the crew arrived so that they wouldn't have as much work to do. So we did everything that we had to do, and most of what we were doing was removing um, uh, launch constraint bolts. There were extra bolts and panels put in to make it uh, strong enough to survive the launch, but were not required once it was on orbit and it had to come out. So we were moving all the launch restraint bolts and panels. Um, we went into the FGB and we cleaned all the filters. We opened up, you know, once the system started running and the fans were running to scrub the air and everything, any debris that uh, didn't get caught on the ground was now on all the filters. So we cleaned all the filters in the modules and uh, just continued to get stuff set up and ready for, uh, for the crew. That night, I had a rule that <clears throat> I had a couple of crew members that really needed eight hours of sleep. Right. <laughs> so on the mid deck of the orbiter, my rule was we're gonna uh, we're gonna darken ship on the mid deck when it's sleep time, and you can stay up. You don't have to go to bed if you don't want to. You can sit up on the flight deck, look out the window, sure. You know, uh, send emails home, whatever. But uh, you got to be quiet. And uh, Jim Newman stayed up late. He was up on the flight deck, and this was when, you know. The crew had gone to bed, were docked to the space station, the hatches open and everything, and uh, we slept on the orbiter. And he goes, down, he wants to go look in the space station one more time and uh, before he goes to sleep. So he goes down on the mid-deck and he's being really quiet, you know. And where my, where I was sleeping and Nancy Curry was sleeping, it was uh, where the airlock used to be. And we had these big bags in there. We call them refrigerator bags, but it hit all the <laughs> stuff that we were taking up to space for sure. space station, leaving stuff on it and everything. And I was snuggled between two of them and she between two others, and he went between them in the middle. And uh, he doesn't want to wake me, you know, and he goes into the airlock, turns the corner, and goes up into the space station. And who does he find but me and Sergei Krikalov in the, in the space station. <laughs> and uh, Hard to leave? Uh, it was. So we were just doing work. We were just mm -hmm. doing more get ahead tests, and we were just talking about what does this mean? What is the future of what we have done here? And uh, he joined us. And if you were on a, we set up uh, sleep shifts on the orbiter, so it was like eight hours of sleep. So think of it as I'm going to bed at 11 o'clock at night, and I'm getting up at 7 in the morning, all right? That's, that's my eight hours of sleep. And um, I think it was finally about 4 o'clock in the morning, and I, I turned to uh, Jim and Sergey, and I said, that's it. Uh, you know, we're done. We got to get some sleep. We got a really busy day tomorrow. We're going to close things up, you know, and uh, get sure. ready for another EVA. And so I made the three of us go to sleep. But uh, that, that was a special night. I mean, it was just, it, just to be in the space station, spending all that time in there, making the logbook entry, talking about what what the future of this was, what it meant to be working together to lay the groundwork to establish a presence. And, you know, I look back now, and anybody that is 18 years old or younger in the world has never known a time that there weren't humans in space. Since October 2000, we have had a permanent crew on the International Space Station, and, and that's our destiny, is to establish that presence, to learn, to explore, to go beyond our home planet. And I, I just, you know, it was, it was pretty special. Words can't express it. it it's uh, unbelievable uh, to be part of such a great program, bringing all these countries together, working together in space for everybody's betterment. And just, you know, this is, it's really outstanding hardware. It's just so nice inside. It's uh, really nice to be in a new home. So thinking about this year, we're celebrating 60 years of NASA. Mm -hmm. We're celebrating 20 years of the International Space Station. Um, so looking ahead, uh, more years of the space station, more years of NASA. What do the next 20 to 60 years look like for us? Oh, man, what, you know, what's I the future? I look back on I, our first 60 years were pretty darn amazing, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and we have accomplished so much. 
but our next 60 years are going to be better. <laughs> you know, as amazing as the first 60 were, the next 60 are going to be phenomenal. I mean, look at the changes just here at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, how our multi-years of spaceport has grown and come to be. You know, and, and it's it, it's only going to continue to grow. Um, the the gateway, the platform we're going to put in orbit around the moon that allows access to anywhere on the lunar surface, it'll be an international partnership. It's going to be a commercial partnership. You know, he, people talk about commercial space and government space and uh, new space and old space, and there's only <laughs> one space, you know? And, and if we as a nation are going to be uh, successful, we need them all integrated together as one. And I just, I, I look forward to how we are working together and what we are accomplishing, and it, it's going to be phenomenal. And then going on to Mars, and <clears throat> it's, it, it, I think we have an absolutely outstanding future in front of us, and we just need to continue to uh, apply ourselves, and great things are going to come. It, it's going to be better. The next six years are going to be far better than the first. Y you often wonder, was I born too soon or too late? Man, if I'd have been born sooner, maybe I could have gone to the moon. Or, man, if I were born later, maybe I'd go to Mars. But the bottom line is we were all born for the right time for us in this uh, life that we live. And uh, I can't imagine... Uh, not being here at the Kennedy Space Center right now, uh, being part of this amazing team that is, is making history. And uh, we're going to look back uh, years from now and say, wow, wasn't that, a, wasn't that an amazing time? Look what we put in place. Look what we made happen and where we are now. And that, that to me, it, it's one of the most rewarding things ever. I don't want to overlook the, the fact that you are the Kennedy Space Center director. <laughs> um, you are now actually the second longest serving center director for yeah, uh, I got for a couple KSC. a couple more years to go and I, I'll be up there with <laughs> Dr. Debus but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a while it's rewarding to me to see what we've accomplished I got asked the other day hey, what motivates you Bob I, I challenged uh, somebody that was in first I said well what motivates you and they were working on a project and I, I was trying to get them to use what motivates them to be able to use for part of this project and build on it and uh, they asked me the next day, out of curiosity, well, what motivates you? And I said, what motivates me is um, being privileged to, to lead this awesome KSC team, to be able to walk into a space and see the smile on someone's face when you ask them what they're doing and they explain it to you and they share the joy and the work yeah. that they have. Th that motivates me. You know, it's... Uh, the success that we have had in our transition from shuttle to establish ourselves as this multi-user spaceport today, that success motivates me to want to do better and to even do more. And, you know, I'm motivated just driving over the Indian River Lagoon in the morning, seeing the sun come up over the Atlantic Ocean and uh, being part of this amazing team at this beautiful wildlife uh, preserve that's the Kennedy Space Center. Very good. Um, thinking about the coming year, uh, if you had to pick the one thing you're looking forward to Commercial the most. crew. All right. So. Uh, no doubt. This is number one priority. <laughs> you know, everybody gets disappointed when they're not the number one priority because everybody <laughs> feels they're number one. And, and programs sure. feel slighted when you don't mention them. But the bottom line is it, it's crucial to us to get uh, crew flying to the International Space Station on a U.S. rocket from U.S. soil. And I want to see that happen. And we've got uh, right now we're on track you know it, it can change we're not going to fly until we're ready to fly right but spacex is looking at a uh, an uncrewed demo flight in january with a crewed flight in uh, june of next year and boeing is looking at an uncrewed flight in april with a crewed flight in august um i got asked well is there more pressure now that uh, the soyuz had the anomaly and the crew had to abort and the answer is no the pressure was always on the commercial crew team. Uh, we can't work any harder or faster than we're already working, and, and we are not going to do anything that is unsafe. We have procedures that we need to follow. We have uh, criteria that need to be met, and we are going to ensure that as we work through the processes that we meet those criteria, that we can certify this vehicle, and that when we fly, it's going to be safe to fly, and we understand the risk that we're taking. It will never be without risk. We are in a risky business business, but we need to understand what the risk is, mitigate it as best as possible, and make sure that we're not taking undue risk. 
Um, and I, I will feel a lot more comfortable on both of these vehicles when we have shown that we have a proven uh, abort capability. And as the Soyuz has shown, you know, capsules are, are very robust uh, in an abort situation and much more so than a winged vehicle. And I just want to make sure that, you know, if we don't always have mission success, we ensure that we take care of the crew. I don't ever want to have to have another uh, Challenger or Columbia. Yeah, and and you mentioned the, that Soyuz mission. Um, seeing the two crew members back on Earth hugging family was that's a that's a priceless moment when you're like, man, this didn't go like we planned, but everybody's home. Amen. Um, so thinking about just the nature of this international partnership, I think that's something that people, if they're aware of, have no clue the full magnitude of how much we cooperate, especially when we're in space like that. And I think that especially now with kind of the way things are politically in the world, there's lots of tumultuous things. Obviously, just recently we had um, an issue with the Soyuz launch where we had an American and a Russian on board, both safe. Um, But certainly like this very amazing bond that holds us together, um, that really there's no, from my perspective, there is no division when we're in space. Um, can you speak to kind of like, is that the reality? Like, no, that is ha- the reality. How, how does that happen? Like, how do, how do you leave Earth and like well, everything becomes better? Because we have a common goal. We, we depend on one another for our health and welfare. Uh, we're in a very harsh environment where everybody has to work together as a team to be successful. And you can't have division. You, you have to have a common purpose. You have to perform as a team. And, you know, I, more astronauts than I have said it. Uh, when you look down on the Earth from 200 miles high, there are very few boundaries that you see. What, what you see is this beautiful blue jewel of a planet with its amazing continents and colors and thin little hazy line that's our atmosphere over the top of it that's that's all that's protecting us from that harsh void of space with its ultraviolet radiation and extreme temperatures and hostility, if you will. And space is the darkest, blackest void you can possibly imagine. No black on Earth does it justice when you're on the sunlit side of the Earth. And, and so I think... You know, we look down on Earth and we see ourselves as humanity, not as citizens of any one country, but citizens of planet Earth. And and so we work together. We have a common goal, a common purpose, and uh, it's it's larger than anything on Earth. I, as a pilot in the Marine Corps and as an astronaut, I ha- I've had the privilege of traveling all over the world and seeing a lot of different cultures and places and, and talking to a lot of different people. and. We all want the same things, Josh. We want good things for our children. We we want to provide for our families. Uh, we want health and, and happiness. And, uh, you know, I, th- I think uh, in many ways, many, many ways, we are all more alike than we are different. And what we need to focus on more is our alikeness and not our differences. Well, Bob, from... Uh from your military service to then your service here with NASA for a, a very long time. Um, <laughs> Bob, thanks for being here today. Absolutely my pleasure, Josh. Thanks for having me on the show. As Bob mentioned at the top of the show, from small beginnings, great things come. I'm Joshua Santora, and that's our show. Thanks for stopping by the Rocket Ranch. And special thanks to our guest, Marine, pilot, astronaut, and center director, Bob Cabana. To learn more about the International Space Station, go to nasa.gov slash ISS. And please check out our other NASA podcasts to learn more about what's happening at all of our NASA centers at nasa.gov slash podcasts. A special shout out to my colleagues, our producer, John Sackman, soundman, Lauren Maitre, editor, Michelle Stone, and our production manager, Amanda Griffin. And remember, on the Rocket Ranch, even the sky isn't the limit. <laughs>